No, it just came up and said, you want to bet a quarter on Duke versus Furman. I said, yes. Take it. I got that going. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, Michael. It's Michael. Mr. Mayor. You doing, Tom? Tom? Life is good. Getting better. Every day. For me? I just miss my family here in yeah, Florida. Me too. I got to go down until Wednesday. Mm. He's figured out the if. I could have skipped these two meetings and gotten this. Right. He's figured out the if now. I'm Jillian, not Julian. That sometimes takes people years to get that. Looking at something. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's okay. I saw my friend TC Wu did not get the nomination. What happened? Good. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. At 7 o'clock p.m. on Monday, the 20th of November, and certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. Uh, if we just take a moment for a silent meditation, please. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are privileged to have with us to lead us in the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Troop 405, and they are affiliated with St. Matthew's Catholic Church here in Durham. We'll turn it over to them. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ask the clerk if you call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. <coughs> Present. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. And Councilmember Shul. Here. Uh, we have two ceremonial items uh, to present tonight. Uh, the first is the Neighborhood Spotlight Award, and I would ask Miss Joni Homer, Hohammer, and you're going to make me pronounce your name correctly when you come up. And certainly any of our neighbors or friends that want to join us, do you have any neighbors or friends here? 
It's okay. It's okay. okay. Uh, as most of you know, the Neighborhood Spotlight Award is awarded monthly, and it's uh, an award that's presented by the Neighborhood Improvement Services Department, and it recognizes uh, individuals who have done outstanding work in their communities, and those individuals are chosen by members of their community. Uh, so tonight, Joni is the recipient of the Neighborhood Spotlight for the month of 2017. And she's a resident of Lansbury, Wartelbury neighborhood. And she was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work, she, wonderful work she's done in her neighborhood. And that includes, but it's not limited to, organizing fun, welcoming neighborhood events, such as National Night Out, promoting communications in the neighborhood by maintaining the listserv and passing out flyers, and supporting volunteers in gathering resources for the neighborhood's Sandy Creek Park Trail improvement. I uh, want to congratulate Joni for this recognition, and the award reads, Neighborhood Spotlight Award. This certificate is awarded to Joni, Lansbury, Waterbury Neighborhood, uh, for organizing fun, welcoming neighborhood events such as National Night Out, promoting communications in the neighborhood by maintaining the listserv and passing out flyers, supporting volunteers and gathering resources for the neighborhood Sandy Creek Park Trail improvements, and signed by the city manager and myself. And I'd like to present this to Joni and for any comments that you might have. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for all your years of wonderful service. We appreciate that. I just wanted to say that I live in a very diverse neighborhood, many different religions, race, ethnicities, political party affiliation, and so on. And um, just increasing the communication uh, getting everyone knows each other in my neighborhood. We've come to really respect each other and even care for each other. So thank you for recognizing that, you know, just even the communication is very important. I appreciate it. And thanks to my neighbors who show up at these events because without them, I mean, that's the neighborhood I dream to live in. So thank you. to recognize a member of the Country Music Hall of Fame. And when I was looking at the AMA, American Music Awards last night, it sort of reminded me of what I'll be doing this evening. I'm going to ask Brady Slitz if you would join me, if you don't mind. Now, this isn't for Brady. This, this for his uh, brother Don. <laughs> for my brother Don. <laughs> okay. Uh, for me. Uh, uh, this is honoring Donald Allen Don Slitz, Jr., who is a member of the Country Music Hall of Fame. Whereas Don Slitz, Jr. is a Durham native, son of former Durham Police Captain Don Slitz, Sr., and Betty Slitz, Goodfellow. He attended Durham Public Schools, graduating from Durham High in 1970, and then attended Duke University before moving to Nashville, Tennessee in 1973 to pursue a songwriting career. And whereas in 1978, his first recorded song, The Gambler, performed by singer Kenny Rogers, reached number one on the country music charts and was followed by 24 other number one songs and many others in the top 10. He also composed the music and lyrics for the Broadway musical, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And whereas he is the winner of many awards for his songs, which among them are the 1979 Country Music Association and Grammy Song of the Year, The Gambler, in 1986, the Country Music Association, Academy of Country Music Association, Nashville Songwriters Association, Song of the Year, on the other hand. In 1987, the Country Music Association, Song of the Year, Forever and Ever, Amen. In 1988, Grammy, Country Song of the Year, Forever and Ever, Amen. In 1988 through 1991, ASCAP, Country Songwriter of the Year, four consecutive years. And 2010, inducted into the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame, and in 2012, inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in New York City. Whereas on October 22nd, 2017, Don Schlitz Jr. was formally inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, joining other famous country music icons. He is described as being among the most influential and beloved songwriters in the history of country music. 
Whereas with all his accomplishments and fame, he finds the time to give back to the community by donating his time and talent and giving weekly performances to some of Nashville's homeless population as part of Room in the Inn, a nonprofit organization that provides shelter, counseling, and educational programs for the homeless. He considers this opportunity to be a small part of something that's bigger than all of us. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby recognize and honor Don Schlitz, Jr. for his humanitarian efforts with the homeless and for his outstanding achievements and contributions to country music, as so recognized by his induction into the Country Music Hall of Fame, adorning the walls of the prestigious Hall of Fame Rotunda, and hereby urge all citizens to recognize Don Schlitz, Jr. for his talents and to take special note of this observance and witness my hand in Corporate Silver City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the 20th day of November, 2017. Before I give this to Brady, I, I also want to recognize, I know he's not here, uh, Chief Fletcher. He, he was really the one that brought this to our attention. And I have to confess, it was sort of belated that uh, persons of this fame had not received recognition any earlier. But uh, it's never too late to correct your mistakes. And tonight, we're certainly doing that. And, going to present this to his brother for any comments that, that he might have. I'd just like to thank the city, uh, number one, for um, recognizing my brother. Um, he couldn't be here tonight. He's got other arrangements that he's uh, out on the road doing different things. Um, however, he always takes a chance. Anytime he talks about anything, he's from Durham. Uh, my sister, uh, Kathy lives in Durham. I do not live in Durham anymore, but I do work in Durham. Um, but anytime that we can, we are proud of Durham. Uh, we're proud of our parents that were born and raised, and they weren't here, but they were worked here all their lives. But uh, thank you so much for recognizing my brother. I'd like to recognize any council persons for with comments. Go ahead. Re recognize. I'll go with Mayor Pro Tem and then uh, Steve, if you don't mind. On Thursday, I received on behalf of the city of Durham the 2017 winner Digital City Survey. And we came in second place for cities of 250,000 to 499, 999 population category. So I present this to our city manager. Congratulations. And it was an honor to get it. If I could, Mr. Mayor, I do want to thank uh, Mayor Pro Tem for uh, representing us at the uh, National League of Cities meeting where this uh, award was presented. Uh, I suppose you could say it was a step down since last year we won first place, but I'm still proud that uh, first and second place year after year is something that uh, the staff has worked very hard, not just Kerry Good and the uh, uh, Technology Solutions Department staff, but all of the city employees who really are looking uh, at every opportunity to improve our communications and transparency through uh, uh, the use of uh, technology. And uh, certainly uh, winning the uh, second place in this large category population is uh, nothing to, uh, to be ashamed of. So thank you. You're welcome. And uh, we're very proud of all the staff who worked hard to earn this recognition. Great. Recognize Councilman Shul and Mary Lex Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, this is our, the last full meeting for several of our colleagues, and I just had a few words that I wanted to offer uh, about our colleagues who are departing from the from the council. Um, all of whom, all four of whom, have re rendered remarkable service to our city on this council and and uh, before arriving on this council. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll start with you. You've been sent off by our entire community with a celebration of your legacy, which you so richly deserve. So I only have one small thing that I want to add to that tonight. Uh, when Howard University asked me to speak about you on film for their alumni awards not long ago, I'd said something that I'm going to repeat now. If they had a Mount Rushmore for Durham, 
I'm not sure who the other three people would be on it, but I know that Bill Bell would be one of those people. Be the only one. For 44 years in elective office, you've been more responsible than any other single individual for the successes of our community. And I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to serve with you, Mr. Mayor, for the past six years. And looking forward a lot to your advice and counsel over the next couple of years. So I'll be calling on you a lot. Thank you. I also want to say to our Mayor Pro Tem, Cora Cole McFadden, I want to thank you for many things, particularly for, I think, being Durham's greatest ambassador, uh, as witnessed by the, just the presentation that we just saw. I, you've served the city in so many ways, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. I've always especially admired your strong, steady, vocal, and active commitment to diversity and racial justice and your unwavering dedication to Durham's young people. You don't just talk about what we ought to be doing for our young people. You're out there doing it every day. You walk the walk. Finally, though, I think it's in your role as Durham's ambassador that, I, in my mind, you've made your greatest mark as the person who, above anyone I can think of, promotes the greatness of our city to everyone who will listen and some who won't. <laughs> uh, no one has represented Durham better than you have over these many years, and you have earned some time off to spend with your grand dog, and you have also earned this community's undying gratitude. I have two grand dogs. Two grand dogs now, that's right. Uh, to my wonderful colleague, Don Moffitt, uh, you have brought a standard of hard work, attention to detail, constituent service, and intellectual firepower that is unmatched, and you have combined that with a strong progressive record on every issue from housing to racial equity to policing. It's hard for me to see how we are uh, going to be able to replace those qualities on the council. They are vital qualities for the success of city government and for our community. What stands out for me, Don, in your years on the council above all is the questions you ask. The hard ones, the challenging ones, the ones that have made all of us look at issues in a new way, that have what, the ones that have made the work of the staff and of this council better. You dig into the details, into the numbers, and here comes the new way to look at things, the excellent questions, and always ask in the spirit of respect and support for the work of the people on our staff. For your daunting work ethic, your search for justice, and your never-ending pursuit of the best policies and practices, this community owes you a great debt of gratitude, and you will be sorely missed. And to our junior departing member, Eddie Davis, you have rendered extraordinary service to Durham as a beloved high school teacher, city council member, and community historian. Walking the streets of Durham with you means stopping every couple of blocks so one of your former students can give you a hug or a high five. You have distinguished yourself on the City Council for your fervent attention to diversity and equality, your willingness to stand alone on hard issues, your unwavering commitment to speak up when the truth needs to be heard, and your role as Durham's community historian. With Durham about to reach its 150th birthday, I know there will be many more opportunities for you to help lead our citywide celebrations of that milestone, and I look forward to that very much. So again, I want to thank all of my departing colleagues for their extraordinary service. Enjoy your Monday nights away from this hallowed chamber, and Godspeed. Thank you. Um, may I respond to Steve? Sure. I, I don't plan to stop coming to City Hall. <laughs> I am going to be watching you. We'll do our each best. Of, each of the new people I will watch. We'll do our best, Madam. Yeah, I will be watching you. Every should I ain't sleeping, every goodbye ain't gone. That's old school. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, didn't know that uh, Dr. Mayor-elect Council Member Shule was going to uh, speak about our departing colleagues. Um, I will forego what I had planned to say and just say this, that in my 713 days as a member of this body, um, I, every time that I've come to a meeting, uh, whether it's a city council meeting here in this chamber or a work session upstairs, I've been very, very fortunate to have the benefit of the wisdom of, of the folks that are going to be leaving the council. Uh, on Monday nights, I am really, really lucky to sit between two real Durham treasures, and I have learned at their feet for the last two years um, so much about the history of our city, so much about how to how to disagree without being disagreeable and about how the work that we do affects the lives of real people. Um, and uh, I learned those lessons on Thursday afternoons too, but I think uh, Councilmember Moffat and I have a, a rich ongoing dialogue during our work sessions 
where um, each of us tries to keep the other on task and on point, and I really appreciate that, uh, that, uh, that dialogue, and I hope that won't end. Um, and Mr. Mayor, I'll just say uh, to you uh, personally, uh, I have felt uh, so lucky and so blessed to have served with you for the last two years. Uh, the sum total of what you've done for our city can't, I don't think, officially, officially or effectively be measured today. Um, but I will just say that it's been uh, one of the privileges of my public life to have served with you and um, look forward to uh, seeing what's next for you uh, as you continue to be a part of our community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll just say for the night, uh, I appreciate greatly the remarks both by Mayor Lex Steve Shule and Councilman Charlie Reese. And uh, I said over and over again, I, I feel comfortable that the city's in a good place and it'll be in an even better place uh, when you have guys have an opportunity to begin governing. And I look forward to that. Are there other comments? If not, I recognize city manager for any priority items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items from the city manager's office. Likewise, city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> okay, we'll proceed with the agenda as printed. And first section are the consent agenda items, which can be approved with a single vote if a council member or member of the public uh, removes an item. We'll discuss that later in the agenda. I'll uh, call the heading of each one of the items. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is citizens advisory committee appointments. Item three is the Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission appointment. Item four is the 2018 city council meeting schedule. Item five is the ordinance to change the fixed route and paratransit fee schedule. Item six is the roof repair and placement of various Department of Water and Management Sites Award of Construction to Triad Roofing Company, Inc. wants to sell them North Carolina. Item seven is Parkwood Area Lift Station Consolidation Project Contract Award to Brown and Cartwell. Item eight is AT&T North Carolina Emergency Telephone System Contract. Item nine is the cooperative purchase group for three replacement automated refuge trucks. Item 10 is the state contract purchase for replacement dump trucks. Item 11 is cooperative purchase group for two rear loading refuge collection vehicles. Item 12 is an amendment to professional services contract with Kimberly Horn and Associates Inc. for accessibility improvements at Valley Springs Park and West Point on the Eno project. Item 13 is the street and infrastructure acceptances. Item 14 is the supplemental agreement for the North Carolina Department of Transportation University Drive Sidewalk Project 50030.3.1-EB-5514. Item 15 is the waste carts, recycling carts, cart parts, and related products and services agreement with Rehig Pacific Company. And item 20 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Items 21 through 26 are also items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. Item 28 is the Durham City County Appearance Commission appointment. Item 29 is the proposed City of Durham logo update. Uh, entertain a motion for the approval of consent agenda item. Second. I'll uh, have to pull 29, which is the logo. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Again, item 29 was full. That is proposed City of Durham logo update. We'll discuss that later in the agenda. On the general business agenda, item 20, 2017 third quarter crime report presentation.
Chief, Chief, before you begin, could, could someone close that back door, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Again, I'm here tonight to present the police department's 2017 third quarter report, which covers the first nine months of the year. The quarterly report covers our department's six performance measures, violent crime, property crime, part one index crime, clearance rates, response times, to priority one calls and staffing levels. The accompanying summary that you already have includes additional statistics and community activities and other significant events during the quarter. Part one index crime was up 5% during the first nine months of 2017 compared to the same period last year. This has been driven primarily by increases in larcenies and robberies, which make up more than half of our part one crimes. Actually, larcenies make up 57%. A lot of these are also attributed to thefts from autos. There were decreases in three out of seven part one crime categories, homicides, aggravated assaults, and burglaries. As you can see, this slide shows a weekly comparison of part one violent crime and property crime for 2017 compared to the same period in 2016. And of course, the spike occurred at the beginning of the year and then we uh, began to implement various types of details and other strategies and we just have been at a plateau over the last uh, several months. The slides also show the statistics through October 28th, which is the, the end of the quarter. Part one violent crime was up by 4% at the end of September 2017 compared to the first nine months of 2016. The number of homicides and aggravated assaults decreased both are at three-year lows. Reported rapes and robberies were up during the first nine months of the year. We formed our robbery task force, as you know, uh, one year ago, approximately a year ago this month, to focus on the increase in robberies, especially consist, uh, consistent reoccurrences of robberies, particularly commercial robberies and those committed with firearms. The unit, the robbery task force unit, have made numerous arrests, a total of 112 since their uh, inception, and each investigator has cleared multiple cases. Although rapes are up, there's no indication based on the uh, suspect and victimology data that we have any type of serial uh, issue. Many of these uh, instances were by acquaintances. There have been several belated sexual assaults reported and several involving family members as well. There were 20 homicides by the end of the third quarter. Three have been ruled as self-defense and there are five open cases. One case involved domestic violence. There have been 24 homicides year to date and there are a total of six open cases. The number of robberies year to date has increased, but investigators made several arrests, as I mentioned, during the third quarter, specifically during the third quarter. Many of these arrests cleared multiple business robberies, as you can see in the accompanying summary that you have. Our specialized robbery unit uh, was formed, um, as I said, several months ago, and they have handled more than 700 cases to date. They focus on commercial robberies and robberies uh, with firearms. In the past year, we have collaborated on 26 robbery cases with our federal uh, partners, the ATF. Five of those suspects have been sentenced to federal time and eight cases are still under active investigation. In 13 cases, we're waiting for sentencing, trial, pleas, or psychological evaluation as well. <clears throat> the number of aggravated assault victims through UCR counts by victims 
drop slightly during the first <coughs> nine months of the year. And just to clarify a little bit about some of the aggravated assaults, the number of multiple victim firearms incidents have dropped, but the number of victims is up slightly. This is due primarily to two incidents with a significant number totaling 28 people. Two incidents that totaled 28 people. Two of those 28 victims were shot. The two incidents, July 6th, 800 block of Andrew Avenue, that incident had 18 victims. Two were injured in that particular incident. On the August 25th, in the 200 block of South Woodcrest Street, there were 10 victims. Both cases are still open. There were no injuries in that second incident. Part one property crime. Part one property crime is up by 6% with an increase in larcenies and motor vehicle thefts. Larceny is made up more than 57% of all part one crime during the first nine months of 2017. Burglaries are continuing a downward trend in which we've seen in the last few years, actually last three years, and they are at a three-year low. A large percentage of our larcenies, 44%, <coughs> are due to motor vehicles and larcenies of vehicle parts. In the next couple of weeks, the department plans to implement what we're calling a clean car campaign, especially during the holidays. As a crime prevention initiative, we hope that this will encourage people to leave the insides of their vehicles clean as they shop, as they're about, uh, out and about, and just on a, a normal work day, not to leave laptops out, cell phones on their seats, and uh, even cell phone chargers in open and plain view to try to encourage people to leave the interior of their car where it's not a target-rich type of environment. We continue to urge people to dial 911 to report suspicious activities in their communities. These calls are often very helpful to our officers in making arrests of individuals in neighborhoods where we have had high instances of burglaries, especially uh, property crimes. We've made several burglary arrests as a result of citizens assisting us with very uh, vital information and being the ears and eyes uh, of their community and their willingness to get involved. Clearance rates for homicide, rape, and all part one property crimes were above the FBI national average clearance rates for cities our size. And for your information, this year, um, the city of Durham Police Department has moved into a different category. We now fall within the 250,000 to approximately 500,000 population group, uh, according to um, the FBI reporting standards. This year, due to patrol staffing shortages, we have pulled investigators uh, to do one-week shifts on patrol to help augment our staffing. This may have had an effect on our clearance rates and our workloads as well. Our annual goal, um, we, didn't, uh, we haven't reached it, but we still have another quarter, so we're gonna be working very hard to reach the 50% for our violent crimes and property crimes at 23% clearance rates. Homicide clearance rates are actually um, the highest that they've been, I know, in the last couple of years since I've been here. So our 2016 statistics are not included in the FBI numbers due to an OSSI data, data problem they plan to uh, provide that information to us at a later date. It wasn't a, an issue for the police department. Some computer and data inputting um, problems occurred with the system. It did, not just the city of Durham, but other cities as well experienced that problem. There were 7,016 priority one calls for service from January 1, 2017 through September 30, 2017. This is a 2% increase over the same period in 2016. Even though we didn't meet 
our target responding uh, to 57% of our priority one calls at under five minutes. 52.41% were under five minutes, which is better than the same period in 2016. Our goal is 5.8 minutes average response time. That's our target. The average response time was 6.12 minutes, which is better than the same period in 2016. We are currently working with the IACP who will be uh, studying the area to conduct a beat realignment um, study and also a scheduling study as well. Response times have improved in the past year and we use supplemental patrols and DPD investigators to help make sure that our staffing levels are where they need to be. I think I've actually seen on the watch record reports a couple of times where it was actually 100% staffing, something I hadn't seen in a while. So um, we're, we're glad to see that. And these officers uh, are all, they picked out a week that they wanted to work through the, through the year and all of our investigators uh, actually went out on patrol for that week, and that program is, is still continuing. It's had a positive impact on staffing, and I think it has also had a positive impact on the morale of the other officers out on the street. An analysis has showed that two of our districts, District 3 and District 4, are the drivers of the longer response time numbers. So those two districts are driving the total response time uh, goals. That, um, and I think that beat realignment study may help us to make some adjustments and kind of balance some things out. The remaining districts have been well within our target numbers. Staffing levels. At the close of the quarter, sworn staffing was at 93%. Our BLAT number 45 class and our ALET number six class graduated in July 16. Uh, DPD recruits graduated from the BLET class and six recruits graduated from the ALET class, which is the first ALET class that the department has held since 2011. The BLET number 46 started on August 7th and we currently have 27 recruits remaining in that class. Our next BLET class is scheduled to start in February. Our goal is to hire 15 recruits in the next couple of weeks as early hires. Um, in, um, in, in this next coming academy, uh, this will help us from uh, missing hiring opportunities on in, of individuals who are good qualified applicants who could potentially go to other agencies. The number of recruit applicants has increased over 2016 numbers. There were 252 applicants in all of 2016, and we've had 269 applicants so far this year, with two testing dates remaining in the fourth quarter of the year. We have recently filled several non-sworn positions, and staffing is better um, than it was uh, during the second quarter of 2017, even for our civilian positions. 35 take-home marked patrol vehicles uh, were ordered as part of the 2016-17 program and have been distributed to patrol officers who live in the city. 34 take-home cars in the 2017-18 budget are in the ordering process now. We expect to begin distributing those vehicles in the spring of 2018. The department's sworn officers took a mandatory eight-hour mental health first aid for public safety course. This training was held during the third quarter as part of the department's comprehensive approach to mental health awareness. The class is designed for law enforcement agencies and provides a general awareness of mental health issues. The class provided information and skills to support citizens in a mental health crisis or, who, or, or persons developing a mental health problem. The IEC pl IECP plans to recognize the Durham Police Department for our efforts in this particular area and, and for achieving a goal of 100% officers trained. We're in the early stages of uh, forming our community engagement unit, that would be the public housing unit, which will focus on public housing communities. 
We've recently identified the actual location in the McDougal Terrace area. Um, and we are currently upfitting that particular office space so that the officers will have computers and all of the um, resources that they need. Uh, I recently met with um, various community leaders in that, in that community just to gauge to see what it was that they hoped to see in our presence in the community. It was a very robust and exciting um, conversation along with the, the um, Durham Housing Authority director and his staff as well. So we're looking at uh, sort of a reception and open house uh, right before Christmas so that we can introduce the initial officers to the community there. Our body-worn camera program has been completed and well actually deployment has been com completed and this slide provides a little bit of information about the deployment. All sworn officers from rank of captain and below are equipped with cameras and have undergone training. A total of 470 cameras have been deployed as of this date. Last Friday, November 17th, we had more than 117,000 videos from our cameras. During October, the first full month of, of department-wide deployment, <laughs> there were 22,400 videos downloaded. The average length of videos from October was 10 minutes and 21 seconds. Uh, right now, we're also partnering with um, couple of students at NCCU to help to <coughs> actually do a community survey. Dr. Brown is uh, working, Dr. Robert Brown is also working with me on, on conducting this community survey about body-worn cameras. We're also planning to conduct an internal survey of our officers as it relates to the cameras as well. Our supervisors regularly audit our officers according to the policy. Uh, the same as they do with our dash cam video as well. There have been currently six incidents that are currently in internal affairs as it relates to um, the use of the body camera. Approximately 25% of our body worn cameras have had uh, various issues, technical issues. However, the company has been very responsive in making sure that we have replacements and, and making sure that there are replacement cameras in stock as well. The new generation camera will be implemented at no cost to the city as they upgrade that technology and we're looking forward to that because it's gonna eliminate some of the issues that we've had in this, um, this current model. It has a lot to do with the buffering um, element that we wanted on this camera, which provides 30 seconds of pre-buffering for the camera before the officer actually turns the camera on. We felt like that was really a critical component to be able to see what occurred prior to the officer turning his camera on. But that, that feature drains the battery down because it requires sort of a, a, a low charge on a regular basis. So some of the highlights, um, our Go Global initiative, I'll talk a little bit about that, National Night Out in the Citizens uh, Police Academy. Our Go Global initiative, um, during the month of September, Captains Addison, Edwards, Lieutenant Mark Murray, and Melissa Bishop attended a week-long Go Global uh, North Carolina initiative specifically designed for law enforcement. Uh, approximately 22 individuals attended this initiative as well. Um, and it's, it was, its intent is to design to improve relationships between law enforcement and Latino immigrant communities. So the officers wrote with um, Mexican officers, met families, families that were living in very um, distressed types of situations and learned much about the history and the culture Already these officers are, have met with El Centro and Pilar and are working on uh, a proposal so that we can have comprehensive education and forums 
for our immigrant community so that we can build and establish better relationships. National Night Out events were held in more than 100 communities. On August 1st, officers attended events throughout the city and met hundreds of residents. Our Citizens Police Academy, 22 people graduated from the six-week Citizens Police Academy on October 5th. These participants attended classes twice a week as part of the, this free learning experience for them. They learned about all aspects of police work, by attending classes, participating in ride-alongs, and in uh, various types of hands-on exercises. We believe this is a valuable tool to improve our relationship with the community through education and transparency, and so that our officers can also learn about uh, community concerns as well. So uh, one of the more recent initiatives is that we're working to reestablish a faith-based uh, initiative so that faith groups can work in partnership with the Durham Police Department and our neighborhoods and community. Several local ministers from various uh, denominations are interested in this endeavor. Uh, we've already had some initial meetings. Our yearly Citizens Police Academy has been so successful that we plan to expand it by creating pop-up citizen police academies so that we can have environments outside of the Durham Police Department in communities and PAC groups in uh, various churches and congregations, recreation centers, mm -hmm. and so on to provide the same type of educational experience in more of a mobile kind of uh, atmosphere. We're excited about, again, participating in the Durham Holiday Parade, which is coming up. Um, we plan to sort of highlight community partnerships this year. We'll be featuring residents from the Durham Housing Authority and members of our Police Athletic League. PAL programs include basketball, soccer, baseball, and golf. We are hoping to soon add a boxing program. We're working to expand <clears throat> the interest in our Blue Benevolence Program, which also funds uh, various programs in the Durham Police Department, such as our mental health outreach, our police explorers, our victims assistance, Citizens Police Academy, and, and, and much more. And that concludes my report. Questions? Well, thank you, Chief. Um, this is very informative, and I'm going to defer to any questions first from any of the council members. Mr. Hans, the Mayor Pro Tem. Councilman Shules and Councilwoman Johnson, in that order. Um, I don't have a okay. I don't have a question initially. I just want to thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, as I move throughout the community, all that I hear from law-abiding citizens are very good comments about the strides of the police department. Are making so I really appreciate that I do have I think it's important to note um, to this uh, to the public that the people in the Mac actually came to to work session to ask you to enhance the presence of, of the police of law enforcement in McDougal Terrace so I don't want people to think that we just pushed uh, law enforcement there they came and asked because they wanted it to happen. Um, I wanted to find out, though, did you get support for your mental health training from the county public mental health folk at all? Actually, what we did was we had several individuals in the Durham Police Department that are part of the crisis intervention team that are actually certified to train. We sent them to training. so a cadre of approximately four or five trainers, uh, four trainers uh, trained uh, the entire police department. It was very good training and it was um, actually um, much longer than the average hour of training that you typically get, but I think officers really benefited from it. It was no cost to the department okay. to do that. And let me thank you for 
um, the police department's response to concerns in Northern Durham. Um, um, Officer Brown, Captain Brown? Yes. Is it Captain? Yes. Captain, Captain April, April Brown. Brown does an outstanding job. So I have only um, very positive comments about you. By the way, I saw Councilwoman Shepard in Good. Charlotte. She sends her regards. Thank you. Thank you so much. For Thank you, Council Member. Recognize Councilman Shule, followed by Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, always a good report. Thank you so much. Thank you. The um, I wanted to just follow up a little bit about the mental health training that was done. So this mental health training is different than CIT training? Is it less? Is it more? What's the... It's actually more. More. My experience with it was that it gives the officers more information <clears throat> about how they can potentially misunderstand a person's mental or physical condition. It didn't really just go into uh, mental disabilities, but it also talked about substance abuse as well, which impacts a person's mental state of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, several videos are shown on how to, to, to best deal with different types of situations. And um, I, I, I found it was very, very um, helpful training. And I know that the officers, uh, we only had positive responses from right. it too. Right. Would you say it's again, an eight hour course? Eight hour course. And would you say again how many officers have been trained in it? The entire police department, however many we had. It was okay. mandatory. We made I made it mandatory for them all to attend. So that would be approximately with the exception of those individuals that were on light duty, which is not not a significant number, approximately five hundred and uh -huh. thirty five officers. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the um the, uh, I want to ask a question also about, just one thing I want to clarify because I think people listening might not understand this. When you talk about 18 victims of an aggravated assault, those are 18 people who were in the house, say, when the shots were fired. Absolutely. And the, so when you have an incident of aggravated assault, we could be in this room and someone were to fire a weapon in this room, everyone in the room who potentially could be struck would be considered a victim of aggravated, and, and that counts part of our crime numbers. Yeah. So when we have large incidents like that, um, it, 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 it really pushes those numbers in the wrong direction. Sure. I just want people to be clear who are listening and may not understand that when we say 18 victims, that doesn't mean 18 people were hit with the That's bullet. That's right. It means they were there. They were, they were there. there. Yeah. The, um, could you talk a little bit about the, you said there are six, I believe you said six incidents in internal affairs related to the body cameras. Could you talk about, is that, can you talk a little bit more about what they are? What are the, what kinds of things are they? Just at a at a high level sort of, they're more about whether the camera's on when it needed to be on. Um, some of those instances were um, were discovered during the investigation of some other type of complaint, or it could have even been uh, a situation where it was an officer who responded to a call to support someone else and forgot to turn his body camera on. He wasn't the primary officer, but when you respond to the call, you're supposed to uh, turn your body camera on as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The, um, I wanted to turn just to the, the larger report for a minute. On page four, it talks about youth arrests, uh, 43 drug violations year to date. I wonder, could you, uh, juvenile petition and adult charges, uh, do you see what I'm referring to there, Chief? It's uh, on page yeah. four. Marsh, you can help me with that one. You have the uh, link. What my, my question really is, so in those 43 drug violations uh, for youth, what typically happens? You know, what, you know, I, 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 what would be the potential disposition of those cases, most likely dispositions? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Mayor members Pro -tem. of council, Mr. Bonfield, Anthony Marsh, Deputy Chief. So the potential dispositions would vary depending upon 
uh, the severity of the charge, or if, if there were accompanying charges to go along with that, or what the person's criminal history might be. Okay. So I could not give you. I understand. I suppose, Chief Marsh, first of all, Chief Marsh, good to see you. Yes, sir. Always a pleasure. Um, could you say what might typically happen if, in, in one of these cases if someone did not have a prior criminal record or was not a company charge, if it was, you know, a possession, uh, you know, let's just say a police officer encountered a young person, 16, 17 years old, um, you know, with marijuana. Well, if it fit, not to cut you off, sir. No, go ahead. If it fits the criteria for our misdemeanor diversion program, yeah. that person should be diverted. Right. And we generally, we not generally, we have a very good working relationship with CJRC, and if one or two slip through the cracks, they're very good about notifying us, like, uh -huh. hey, this person looks like they should have been diverted. Can you tell us what happened? And we'll follow up with the officer and find out what went into the decision-making process in that particular case. That is not very common. You catch a juvenile with, uh, say, a, a, a felony yeah. amount mm -hmm. of, of whatever particular substance, that's a different discussion, and that goes into the court system. And then, but then again, still, and not to speak for the court system, but there are other um, avenues to redirect interventions for young people who are first-timers in the yeah. court system. And, and of course, now we, we're going to have the new 18-year-old age of juvenile age, so that'll be yes, sir. another change. Of the 43, and I, I, don't, I don't, I don't, you know, what might, if of, of 43 typical youth arrests for drug violations, um, how many of those might typically be referred to the misdemeanor diversion court? I, I, I honestly would not be, I wouldn't want to give you a speculative answer yeah. on okay. that because okay. they're really looked at on a case by case um, basis sure. and for the officer, and that's with the police department, and again, you know, I can't speak for what goes on with the sheriff's department, and yeah. there's, I think there's some information here, uh, including... We have, we have some stuff on the Mr. Diversion, Diversion Court uh, that we have in here, but I was just trying to make some sort of connection between what we're seeing in these uh, youthful drug arrests and the numbers I saw in the misdemeanor diversion court. It wasn't clear what the connection was, so... And council member, we can always take these 43 cases... And take a deep dive into it and, and take a look at it and provide that information for you. I, I, I don't... I'm not asking for a lot of extra work. If there was something that was easily available, I would love to see it. I'm not asking for a lot of extra work, but if there is something that you do have that would be easy, I'd love to see it. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's easy to do. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Marsh. And then the, I noticed also on page five that drug violations are down about half from two years ago, uh, about 430 fewer. And uh, I think that this is, these are minor drug violations, which we are, this is part two crime. Yeah. Uh, that uh, I think, I'm glad that we're not criminalizing these small acts and appreciate the work of the department and the priorities that you have on violent crime, which is what I think we ought to be concentrating on. Absolutely. Um, on, then I saw and also that the driving while impaired uh, was down from 344 to 223. Um, and so I was wondering about why this might be. Does it have to do with not conducting <coughs> checkpoints? Is, it, is there something else that's going on in terms of enforcement for people who are driving while impaired? It could be a combination of things, uh, Councilman. It could be certainly a lot of things are impacted by staffing. Yes. A lot of things are impacted by call volume. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I would really kind of drill down into throw it back on staffing for the most point. Okay. And then um, just finally, uh, again, at the end of the year, I'd love to see an annual summary for the Misdemeanor Diversion Court. I think you typically give us that. I think last year we got that, didn't we? Yes, sir. Yeah. And then the, um, finally, you all just they, they recounted more instances than I could uh, mention here. The great police work, just pages and pages of, of, of that were in the report of excellence by our police officers, very courageous and thorough and uh, humane, and I just thought that uh, it's, it's always instructive to read those and very much appreciate it. So thank you very much. Appreciate it, Chief. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Recognize Councilwoman Johnson.
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chief, for your report. Um, I just had a couple of questions. I wondered if you have the sense or an idea of what's driving the increase in reported rapes. I feel like it's very unlikely that we're actually having an increase in rapes, but rather an increase in reporting is what's responsible for that. Do you have a sense of what's causing that spike? Well, uh, you know, I had that conversation with, with someone earlier this week or last week, and I, I don't know that it's the climate. Mm -hmm that um, we have more individuals that are feeling comfortable with the outcry of what occurred with them in a sexual offense. And uh, we are, it, it, even in relationships where these are known individuals, people are, are being more educated about what their rights are in personal relationships too. So um, that might be a contributing factor as well. Um, we have looked at them very closely because we want to make sure that we don't have any type of, you know, systemic issue. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and our local rape crisis center, y'all have a relationship with them, I'm sure, to help people get resources. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and we always pair pair our. We have internal referrals too, but we always pair victims up with our crisis intervention folk to follow up to make sure that they get the assistance and feel confident about the reporting uh, process. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm not sure if we talked about this the last time you were here about um, data related to the body camera rollout. Um, the kind of our, our two goals or primary goals in um, rolling out the body cameras was I hope that it would reduce both complaints against officers and use of force by officers. I was wondering if you all have a plan for how to, how to study and measure that as the cameras get rolled out and as we have more data on it? Well, we, we are keeping track of our use of force complaints and our citizen complaints as well. And I could have brought that. We, we actually have some up, updated information as it relates to our use of force complaints and our citizen complaints. Both categories are down considerably. And I'll be glad to provide that information to you. Our internal affairs um, office, the commander there, puts out a monthly report on use of force complaints and um, also citizen complaints, citizen encounters. That'd be great, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, yes. I'll defer to Councilman Reese. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, hi, Chief, how's it going? Good, sir. <laughs> um, I wanted to pick up, you know, I, Council Member Shule mentioned that there were too many stories in the report uh, to mention but I feel compelled to talk about two of them. Um, an investigator in, in the Criminal Investigations Unit, uh, I believe this was in August, uh, encountered a family, uh, mother, daughter, and a service dog who had just come here from New York City and needed a place to stay. This investigator worked at a local motel to get a discount for the family, paid out of the investigator's own pocket to stay at a hotel. Uh, for a night, uh, connected them with a faith community here in Durham to give them some help. Continued to work with the family, was able to help them find a more permanent living situation. Uh, got the daughter enrolled in school, uh, bought school supplies for the daughter, uh, helped them get some food. Um, I, that's the kind of officer we need uh, to lift up in this community, and I just want to say I'm, I'm really, really amazed by that. Also, can someone get figure out what is um, in the investigators Guardino's lunchbox and get that passed out to the rest of the, the investigators because in, the, in the, about a month's time, uh, he uh, cleared a string of first degree burglaries in the Five Oaks subdivision, arrested two people on a total of 38 charges for abuse of, the, of a disabled person, um, identified a suspect, identified three suspects uh, uh, who had been plaguing uh, the parking lots near the American Tobacco Campus uh, with vehicle break-ins, um, cleared a bank robbery, <laughs> of all things, recovered a stolen vehicle in that case. Um, so uh, a special special recognition to Officer Guardina. I know he's one of our one of your employees of the month in September, and I really uh, just amazed by the work that our officers do um, under very difficult conditions. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit also about. Um, just to remind you about beat realignment, you mentioned it a couple of times. 
Yes. I know that you know that's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I think the very first conversation you and I had together yes. um, was about this subject, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, how that moves forward. I know that you know that, in my opinion, this is critical to making sure we have the right resources in the right areas, um, and that I think that'll make a huge difference in continuing to reduce our response times. So thank you for the work that's happening on that. Also, the staffing levels look fantastic right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really happy. I know you guys are working really, really hard on that. Um, and I really appreciate the work on that. Um, I'm amazed at how quickly you guys have gotten up and running and are working to upfit um, the your housing authority uh, presence. Um, I was uh, really heartened by the response, uh, both by uh, you personally, the police department is also the DHA, uh, to the really sincere plea yeah. from that community. Um, and uh, the president of the resident council, as you know, came to our work session and talked to us and talked to you about uh, wanting to have more police presence. And I really appreciate the very deliberate and intentional way that you're going about building that relationship. It's really, really important that it be done that way, and I, and I appreciate it. Um, I did have a question about the body-worn cameras. One of the things that we had talked about and I can't remember if it was at a, at a quarterly report or some other context, was, tr was getting some periodic information from the department, uh, probably in this report, quarterly report, about any requests to view footage that you have received. Uh, any, any uh, I, I certainly think that we probably would have heard if a member of the media had gone to the courts to try to get a, a court order disclosure. Um, and I, I I just wondered if we, if I could ask you to, to add some of that information in future reports, if you think that's feasible. I, I, I think it is. I mean, just to be able to provide information about requests, I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think we've had a significant number. But, but yes, absolutely, it is. The other thing I will mention um, is that I had a constituent reach out to me yesterday or this morning. I can't remember to point me to a news item regarding the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, their chief, Arredondo, recently um, started putting uh, data about police use of force incidents on the police department's website. Um, obviously, uh, the names of officers are not part of that information request, uh, but they do include information about what kind of forces officer, force officers have used where in that city the incidents happened, basic demographic information on folks who were the subjects of police use of force. Um, I know that we that North Carolina law is gonna be different from Minnesota law and there may be obstacles uh, to, uh, to making that type of information available, but I'd like to encourage you to consider um, making that information more broadly available in whatever forum or format that we, we can uh, as, as I've said to you many times, the use of force by Durham police officers is one of the most serious things that happens in our city. It is the, the authority by which officers use force is delegated to them by the people of this city. And uh, to the extent that we can share that information from the people uh, from whom their authority derives, all of our authority, I think our city will be better for it. And I'm glad to hear your uh, comments about the the data that you've seen and look forward to seeing that as well. Um, so if I if you have any thoughts on that, I'd love to hear it. Um, I, I actually know the chief very well. We went to the FBI Academy together, so he's oh. he's been in his position probably all of three or four months and is, is obviously um, doing some creative things, but I'll reach out to him to see how his policy drives that and maybe look at how we can be as transparent as we can with use of force. Thank you, Chief. The other, the last thing I just wanted to mention is just to echo what the Mayor Pro Tem said. You know, as I, as I talk to folks in Durham, I, as I go to community events, it's amazing how often I see you at them. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I go to a few things, uh, but you're, you're at a lot more things based on what I hear. I just really appreciate your personal engagement. Uh, it's one thing to develop uh, a leadership team and to work with you to, to get your agenda implemented within the city uh, police department. It's another thing to have you in the community personally and being uh, talking to folks. It makes such a huge, huge difference. And I know that all of us appreciate the amount of time that it takes for you to do that. Um, 
Uh, and I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for approaching the job that way. It, it, it really does make a difference. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your comments. I think it's very important for me to be out there so that um, the community can get to know who I am and, and hear from me what my position is. And, you know, we have a lot of very casual conversations that typically sort of dispel myths about various, you know, things going on in the police department. I think it's been very helpful, and I, I, I do enjoy it. Um, before I sit down, I wanted to tell this um, body thank you for supporting the Durham Police Department over the last few months, too, at our, our employees' appreciation. Um, they always appreciate seeing uh, council members as well, and, uh, and also at um, Deputy Chief Rick Pendergrass's uh, retirement and, uh, and his send-off. Thank you all for being there. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the only question I had, Chief, um, I, I know you give it to me, but could you give me your honest mm -hmm. opinion about the fact that we've rolled out body cameras uh, in terms of, I know there's a lot of controversy when we got into this. Uh, you have any thoughts about that and the reservations of having done it? Uh, I, I have absolutely no reservations. I, I think that was probably... Um, one of the most wisest decisions the city could have made to um, outfit our officers with body cameras. Uh, anytime you roll out devices, and it's it's a learning curve, it's new, um, you have glitches, but, um, and I think the officers had apprehension about what this was going to mean for them as well. Um, by far, the officers appreciate the body cameras and they appreciate that the body cameras help not just them pay attention to their posture, their behavior, but it also helps the citizen realize that this, this incident is being recorded. So, um, you know, hopefully the body cameras have um, sort of imposed a calming uh, mechanism, um, you know, by way of of recording incidents. So uh, I think it was a very, very smart move for the city and I, I continue to look to see that this, this program uh, is supported by better technology as it rolls out. So um, thank you all for voting yes on the body cameras. All right, thank you. No further questions. Thanks thank again. Thank, thank you. We'll move into the general business agenda, public hearings, item 21, resolution approving an installment finance contract and providing for certain other related matters. Good evening, Mayor, Member City Council. Uh, I'm David Boyd, Finance Director. Uh, this public hearing is being held to receive comment on a proposed bond issuance to fund the new parking deck other parking-related improvements, and to refinance certain other outstanding debt. Uh, the details are included in your materials, but uh, happy to answer any other questions you or council might have. Thank you. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report other questions by members of the council on this item. If not, is anyone in the public who wants to speak on this item as being a public hearing? Uh, let the record reflect that no one asked to speak on this item. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, before council. Mayor. Move the item. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. I just wanted to come. I wanted to thank um, the department and the director for your um, for the work that you do, keeping the finances of the city in line and keeping us with our AAA bond rating, which is so important to the interest rates that we have to pay and the taxes that we have to um take from our citizens in order to pay those interest rates. So thank you for your work, David. Thank you for that. I thought I had a motion to second on signing. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We move to item 22, consolidated annexation item for 208 Smallwood. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Um, before I turn it over to Jacob to present tonight's uh, Planning Department items, I wanted to very briefly update you on our efforts to improve 
the motions associated with planning public hearing items at your October 16th meeting, there were concerns raised about the format, clarity, and consistency of the motions uh, with these items. And so we consulted the city attorney's office and are recommending an approach that will use consistent language, a consistent format, and one action per motion. Uh, and what this means, and Jacob's gonna pull up a slide here in just a moment, uh, is that there will be up to five uh, motions for each case. Um, that would be when all items displayed here on the screen uh, are being requested by an applicant. Uh, the number of motions will vary based on the, on the uh, which items are being requested. There could be as few as two uh, in cases where there's only a zoning map change and a consistency statement, as many as five is when, when there's an annexation and a proposed change to the comprehensive uh, plan, future land use map. Uh, and so this will be the order in which these motions appear uh, and the, the specific language is here. I don't expect you to be able to read that per se, but um, there, there will be consistent language and will consistent order again. And uh, those are numbered in your uh, agenda material. Uh, and of course, we'll get any feedback from you all. We, we're gonna try this tonight. If you all have any changes you wanna make or the, or the clerks do, or the manager's office does, we'll continue to refine and improve this. All right, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I, I do have a question, yep. briefly. Um, and that is that, uh, I assume that sort of under the, the way that we've been doing things, that if, if one were to say, I'm, I'm, I will move the annexation, uh, or oh, it's an ordinance, right? I'll move the annexation, approval of the annexation petition, that would be sufficient, right, without all the language of that you had that was just showing here. Yes, I, I would recommend that you refer directly to the language in the agenda package. Uh, you know. to, to the recommendation that's in the, with the agenda memo or on the agenda itself. So for example, move the annexation item as published in the agenda item or something to that effect. Because that has all the specifics in it about the, the property location and, and what effective date and other things like that. So like on this item, oh, there's the annexation ordinance, okay. Right. right, we have five motions, four motions, and two motions tonight, <laughs> the three items. Right, okay. Tony, did you finish? Okay. Tony. Thank you all very much. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I should ask the city attorney real quick, Is I'm assuming there's some legal reason we have to vote separately on all these? We, we've discussed that, and, and the way that it's set up, it, it does suggest that we need to be clear of what we're actually voting on. Um, Don and I had this discussion this morning, and I think for now I would just, just go there, and, and as we've worded it for you, it should be pretty straightforward um, uh, going on. Works for me. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Just, just for an example, on this first one, which the first item would be an, an annexation petition, right? The, but the, the resolution itself is two pages long. We, you don't need the entire resolution, Patrick. You don't need the entire resolution read into the record, do you? No, you don't. Just a referral to the, resol to the resolution that's in the packet. That's right. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, I'm Jacob Wiggins um, with the planning department presenting tonight's public hearing items. Um, and I would like to state for the record that all planning items in front of you have been noticed in accordance with applicable state laws as well as the requirements of unified development ordinance. Um, the first item in front of you is a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation petition, and zoning map change received from Catfish Farm, LLC, for a contiguous 24 acre parcel located at 208 Smallwood Drive. Um, if approved, this annexation will become effective on December 30th of 2017. Excuse me, that would be December 31st. Um, the applicant has submitted um, a zoning map change in conjunction with this request to change the zoning designation of the property from residential rural to plan development residential 6.458. Um, some key commitments on the associated development plan. Uh, the applicant has committed to a maximum of 155 residential units. Um, those would be townhouse only units, which is another commitment. 
um, as well as some roadway improvements to Smallwood Drive and Page Road. Um, the Public Works and Water Management Departments have determined that the City of Durham Water and Sewer Mains have capacity for this project, and the Budget and Management Services Department determined that the annexation will likely be revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Uh, the Planning Commission heard this request at their August 8, 2017 meeting and recommended approval of this request by a vote of 10 to 0. Um, I would like to make one correction for the record. Um, thanks to Councilman Shul for catching this in your staff report on attachment 15 in table 5 um, in regards to the student generation numbers. The numbers are inverted on the table. However, the table or the language preceding the table does note that the request is expected to increase student generation numbers by 44. That is correct. Um, it's just the numbers got a little flipped on the table. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that council may have regarding this. Um, and I would close by noting that these staff does find that these requests are consistent with the conference plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Um, and as Director Young noted, this item um, will ultimately require four uh, separate motions and votes. Thank you. You've heard the uh, staff report. Are there questions on this item by members of the council? Recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jacob, um, yes, sir. the 1,190 additional trips that are in, uh, in attachment 15, table two, um, the, the, uh, I've heard this already in an email exchange I had with, uh, with um, Patrick Young, but I just wanted to, thought it was worth mentioning here because I, at least I didn't pick up on this in the, um, in the memo, Page Road is already significantly over capacity at level of service D. Um, and But I, it's my understanding that there will be, the developer will be adding enough, uh, a, a new lane such that uh, this will be, it, it, this will still be at level of service D, is that right? Correct. Um, the applicant has proffered a commitment to build a northbound left turn lane into the site along Page Road. So at that area, um, with that impact as well as the other impacts uh, from the transportation improvements, staff finds that th that area should have a level of service at 99% of LOSD. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask a question. This, this is the last time I'll be going through zoning, so I don't know why I'm asking this. I'm not going to have to deal with it. But just the order of how, how we do this. I mean, the, the net of this proposal is someone wants to do the PDR. Okay. So why would it not be appropriate first to determine whether or not we want to do the PDR before talking about annex and then extending utilities and et cetera, et cetera? And maybe the answer is because it's not in the city and we can't do that, but is, is that the reason? Yes, that is why it's structured as it is. Okay, because mm -hmm. it's not in the city, therefore we can't talk about the zoning. Um, I mean, I would defer to the no, council's me. legal counsel, but I think the council could discuss the ramifications of the case, even if I mean, it's not. Because, I mean, the, the net of it is, if if we don't want the zone, there's no sense in talking about the annexation, utility extension, and all those things. So, mm -hmm. And that was, uh, Mr. Mayor, that was part of, you know, when we talked about bringing these as consolidated action, usually, I mean, back in the day, it, it happened in separate, completely separate actions. Um, so we've got everything in front of you now. But I would agree with you, if you don't want to change the, uh, uh, the, the zoning, you definitely don't want to go through the, uh, the things that you're doing before. But it is sort of set up chronologically to bring it into the city to do the uh, uh, utility extension agreement just like that. But if you don't want to do the PDR, you, you definitely don't want to go through um, these other items. So we can't discuss the PDR first? Oh, we can't. Well, it's all consolidated now, so I would okay. say that you can discuss okay, well, whatever you want to discuss. It's just a matter of which order we do the motions. In. Right. <laughs> okay, I recognize uh, Patrick Biker, who's the only one to sign to speak for this item. And before, is, is, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? If not, you, know, you have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, members hey, of the Mr. City Council. Sir. My name is Patrick Biker. I'm with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive here in Durham. 
I'm here representing Catfish Farms, the longtime owner of this property for this agenda item. It's been my privilege to work with these gentlemen for over five years now, since they were involved in the effort to rezone the parcel adjacent to the west for townhouses. This adjacent parcel is shown in your staff report, and it is currently under construction. Just to give a little more history, about five years ago, the City Council unanimously approved the townhouse neighborhood that's under construction along the south side of Alexander Drive. The Catfish Farms ownership group has always envisioned that once the adjacent parcel was under development, Catfish Farms would move forward if the market continued to be strong. We are experiencing very strong demand for these townhouses, and so now is the time to move forward with the entitlements for the 24 acres owned by Catfish Farms. This makes sense because a couple of years ago, the developer of the townhouses next door entered into a cost-sharing agreement with NCDOT to pave Smallwood Drive, which had been a gravel road for decades. The townhouse development we are discussing tonight eventually will have access to both Smallwood Drive and to Roach Drive in order to dis disperse traffic, and this will create better, better access for these townhouses, as well as for our neighbors, Henderson Grove, Missionary Baptist Church, and All Saints United Methodist Church. Since this proposal follows our comprehensive plan, has a unanimous recommendation of, for approval from the Planning Commission, and fits in well with the existing development, we respectfully ask for your approval. I'll be happy to try and answer any questions you may have, and we thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. Other questions by the council? Attorney, recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Patrick, I, I note that this uh, development is uh, proposing to add uh, 44 students above the current zoning. Uh, many developers proffer $500 per student added uh, to Durham Public Schools. Have you considered such a proffer? proffer? Uh, Council Member Shule, we, we researched what the adjacent uh, townhouse development did, and they contributed fifteen thousand uh, dollars for the school students, and that's a much larger uh, development with around two hundred and sixty townhouses. This one's going to be under one hundred and fifty five, and so our team can do uh, ten thousand dollars to be paid uh, prior to the time of site plan approval. And one also reference what the mayor brought up in terms of uh, traffic that this development is also taking on. Uh, traffic improvements that are pretty significant for a relatively small townhouse community. So I'll be happy to wordsmith that with the planning director in the morning. Thank you. Are there other questions uh, of the developer and members of the council? Uh, hearing none, let the, reflect, the record reflect that no one in the public asked to speak on this item. I would declare the public can be closed and matters back before the council. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the uh, approval of the annexation petition. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open? It's no discussion. Will you open the vote? Open the vote. Did you open the vote? Mm -hmm. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the approval of the utility extension agreement. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the consistency statement. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move the approval of the request for a new use zone rezoning case. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members Moffat and Davis, thank you very much for all your understanding and patience over the years. It's been a privilege, and I bless you all with many more years with your family and your friends. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is item 23, consolidated annexation item for Ellis Road townhouses phase two. Jacob Wiggins again with the planning department. Um, so this is a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, future land use map amendment, um, and zoning map changed um, for seven contiguous parcels totaling approximately 16 and a half acres, generally located at 2725 Ellis Road. Um, if approved, 
this uh, annexation will become effective on December 31st, 2017. Um, the applicant has submitted a future land use map amendment um, to change the future land use map designation from low density residential to low to medium density residential. Um, and the zoning map change to change the current zoning to plan development residential 6.678. Some key commitments on the development plan associated with this request include a maximum of 110 residential units, um, a commitment to only provide townhouse units, as well as some roadway improvements to Ellis Road. Um, the Public Works and Water Management Departments performed the utility impact analysis, which determined that the city water and sewer mains have the capacity for this project. And the Budget and Management Services Department determined that the request should be revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Uh, the Planning Commission considered both of these items at their July 12th, 2017 hearing and recommended approval by a vote of 11 to zero. <coughs> um, staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances and that there are five separate motions and votes required for this item. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have at this time. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Would ask again other questions by the council, the staff, for the staff report. Hearing none, uh, let me call on Laura Holloman. And is it anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Again, this is a public hearing item. Not yet three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Um, Good evening, uh, members of the City Council, as well as uh, City staff. Um, Laura Holloman with Spalding & Norris, um, representing the applicant tonight. Um, as uh, staff mentioned, thank you for the, for the thorough uh, work you have done with the, with the staff report. You all always do a great job. Um, the request we've brought before you tonight, this low to medium density development, will provide an apt transition with step down density between the existing higher multifamily density along Ellis Road, like-minded density adjacent to the west, industrial to the west and southeast, and Bethesda Park and existing single family to the north and east. The comp plan uh, amendment examines four cr criteria when considering revisions to the plan, whether the proposed change would be consistent with, with the intent, goals, guiding principles, and program with any adopted plans, whether the proposed change would be compatible with the existing land use pattern and or designated land uses, and whether the proposed change will create substantial adverse impacts to the adjacent area, and whether the subject site is of adequate shape and size. Staff did concur that, these propo that the proposed development meets that criteria. Uh, the development would develop at acceptable suburban densities and land use patterns and would avoid patterns of leapfrog, non-continuous scattered development. Um, and the staff did go over the text uh, commitments that we are committing to tonight. Um, we did receive unanimous uh, recommendation from, of approval from your uh, planning commission. And I'd just like to, to comment on um, one of the, the commissioners, um, Miller. He provided a comprehensive explanation of his thought process in recommending approval and said, and I quote, as I did when the developers brought phase one to the plan commission, I think it is appropriate to point out that the care with which the developer has crafted design commitments intended to address the policies promoting attractive residential development in chapter four of the comprehensive plan. Through their commitments, the developer offers assurances that they will seek to avoid design monotony and, repeti and repetitious presentation of garage door openings. End quote. Uh, we have truly embraced your adopted policies and high expectations for managed growth in Durham and sincerely ask for your positive vote tonight. Thank you. Welcome to questions. Any questions? Again, this is a public hearing. Does anyone else want to speak on this item? Let the record reflect no one else asked to speak. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Mr. Mayor, I will move that we, uh, I believe I'm first supposed to move and adopt the ordinance annex annexing the Ellis Road townhouses. Second. second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7-0. 
Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'll move the utility extension agreement. Second. Property moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. I move the um, to approve the requested change in the future land use map. Second. And properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. I move the consistency statement. Second. Properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Passes seven to zero. And I'll move the requested, uh, that we approve the requested uh, rezoning application. Second. Property move and second. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Passes seven to zero. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. We move to item 24, zoning map change for DLLTRR. Thank you, <clears throat> Jacob Wiggins, again with the Planning Department. Um, Jared Edens, um, agent for the applicant, proposes to rezone approximately <coughs> four acres located at the intersection of North Roxbury Street at Bush Drive. Um, this site can, comprises six parcels, currently zoned commercial neighborhood with a development plan and residential suburban 20. Um, and Mr. Edens is proposing to change this designation to commercial um, neighborhood with a development plan. Um, permitting commercial uses, between a range of 16,000 to 20,000 square feet. Um, the development plan associated with this request does prohibit some uses. Um, the four uses specifically are drug stores, convenience stores, gas stations, and restaurants with drive-through facilities. Um, some other key commitments on the plans include, as I noted, the 16,000 to 20,000 square feet of commercial floor area, the closure of Bush Drive, and some additional project boundary buffer and screening proffers. The Planning Commission considered this item at their September 12, 2017 hearing and recommended approval by a vote of 14 to 0. I mean, staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Um, action for this item will require two votes. Um, one for the consistency statement and one for the zoning map change ordinance. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have at this time. Again, it's the public hearing. Uh, recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jacob, attachment 10, BPAC comments number five about the consultation with Go Triangle as regards the, to the, uh, the need for a potential uh, bus stop at the. You with me? <laughs> yeah. How does that consultation work with Go Triangle? I mean, so we often see this. What happens after we approve this? What happens? How does that consultation take place? And, you know, do these things, you know? I'm going to defer to Mr. Bill Judge. Yes, uh, Bill Judge Transportation. Uh, in this case and in many of the cases, the applicant has proffered to provide transit improvements uh, adjacent to the site along. Roxboro Road um, with a final determination to be made at the time of site plan. Given that we don't know exactly when they'll come in with the site plan, could be next week, could be a year, two years, and sometimes our transit needs change. Um, that's why we try to make that determination at the site plan. So when they come in with a specific use and they can determine the, the estimated transit needs of the site, it, um, we review it with Go Triangle. Go Durham to make a determination as to whether or not uh, a bus shelter is needed or warranted. And is it is it something that you think about? I'm I'm just wondering how far in the future you all will typically think about that. In other words, does it have to be that the bus shelter is warranted at that red hot second, or you know how how do you all think about that? Um, it's a little of both. I mean, it's primarily based on the the routing in place at the time or known changes in routing. And as well as the um, intensity of potential transit riders from the site or at the existing stop from existing uses. Thank you, appreciate it. Any other staff 
Questions by the council? Uh, we have one person that has signed up to speak on this item. Jared Edens. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? <clears throat> if not, you have three minutes. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land. I'm here representing my client, uh, the Durham Rescue Mission. Uh, as Jacob uh, summarized, we're proposing a commercial zoning here on Roxborough Road. This is for the Rescue Mission to uh, construct another one of their bargain centers. They've got four or five over town that have become a, a big part of their program and what they're doing. Uh, they identified this location as a, as a good spot. So here we are. Um, we did make some proffers at Planning Commission to address uh, some concerns from our neighbors at the Eno River. Uh, we're adding an opaque fence along one part of the property that sort of shields the park area from the building area. Uh, we also agreed to limit our building and parking envelope on the site. Uh, to reduce impervious areas. That was at the request um, of planning commissioners at the last meeting. Uh, so we received a 14 to zero vote at that time and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions by council on the developer? Mr. Mayor, I would just comment. I ask council Shul. Uh, appreciated the attention to the environmental concerns which you mentioned, Jared. Thank you. Any other comments? I have a question. Do you have any meetings with neighbors in that area? Excuse me? Did you have any meetings with uh, affected neighborhoods in that area? I mean, hold on one second. Let me check for one second. I'm sorry. No, ma'am. So we, we did not have a neighborhood meeting for this okay. site because there wasn't a comp plan amendment, but we did respond as issues arose. Okay. Thank you. If there are no further questions, uh, I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters by report to council. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the consistency statement. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close vote. It passes seven to zero. Mr. Mayor, I'll move approval of the rezoning request. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Let's move to the next item, which is item 26. 25. 25. Huh? <clears throat> Confirmation of assessment role for street completion and portions of Ravenstone subdivision. So I have item number 26. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bell, members of council. I'm Robert Joyner of the- Oh, that was my fault, 20, 25. 25, I apologize. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of council. I'm Robert Joyner of the Public Works Department. Item 25, to conduct a public hearing to receive comments on the confirmation of assessment role for street completion in portions of the Ravenstone subdivision and to adopt a resolution confirming the assessment role for street completion in Ravenstone subdivision within the limits specified in the agenda. Staff has received objections to the assessments for seven properties representing 2.6% of the 233 properties being assessed. The objecting owners feel that no part of the cost of the street completion should be passed on to the owners and the cost should be covered by other means. Suggestions included property taxes paid over the years, HOA dues, the builder, and the developer. I'll be happy to answer any questions council may have. Again, this is a public hearing. Are there questions by members of the council on this item? Uh, is anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? No one that signed up to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect no one in the public asked to speak on this item. I would declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters by for council. Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll move that we confirm the assessment role for street completion in portions of Ravenstone. Do that one. Yes. Second. 
It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll move to item 26. It is the confirmation of assessment role for street completion and portions of Stonehill Estates subdivision. Uh, Stonehill Estates, item 26. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of the council. I'm Robert Joyner of the Public Works Department. Item 26 is to conduct a public hearing to receive comments on the confirmation of assessment role for street completion in portions of the Stonehill Estates subdivision and to adopt a resolution confirming the assessment role for street completion in Stonehill Estates subdivision within the limits specified in the agenda. Staff has received objections to the assessments for 22 properties, uh, totaling 10.8% of the 203 properties being assessed. It should be noted that 15 of those properties are owned by the HOA. Two of the objecting owners stated the cost should be covered by the builder or developer. A third owner stated the assessment would create a hardship as she has experienced a loss of income due to medical issues and has excessive medical bills. Regardless, she felt that no cost should be passed on to the owners. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Again, this is a public hearing. Uh, the public hearing is open. Are there questions by members of the council and the staff of the board? Recognize Mayor Pro Tem. On the citizen who had the hardship, what do we normally do with those cases? I, I recall our having done something in the past. In the past for uh, other, there, there has never been a case like this before okay. uh, in these particular types of assessments. So in other types of assessments, uh, those items are, are always based on a specific um, hardship case or, or other things, and council has allowed relief until tap on and, and other types of uh, reliefs uh, that wouldn't apply in this particular case. But in, in this case, uh, if the assessment is confirmed, if the property owner had a financial hardship and didn't didn't have the money to pay, the, the assessment and the lien would just stay on the property until it was disposed, correct? That is correct. Until the property is disposed, mm -hmm. okay. And they also have 10 years at 0% interest to pay this over time. It, looking at Council Marsh. Yeah, so I know that we're, we've dealt with this case actually for a little over two years now. But just for people who might be watching, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but this is a situation where typically the homeowners, property owners would pay 100% of the costs, and we're down to a much smaller percentage of that. And in fact, we took it down to, remind me, I think it's five, $500 a lot? It's $800 a lot. $800 a lot. 15% of the estimated cost. 15%. So the city's already picking up 85% of the costs, and I just wanted to reiterate that, not because anybody up here doesn't know that, but because people listening may not understand exactly what the, uh, this, this issue is. So there's uh, several million dollars or millions of dollars worth of work that didn't get completed by the developer years ago. And we're now at the very last point of cleaning this up and getting it. The work is done, right? Work is done. For all the streets. Right. Stormwater work still has to be completed. Right. And the, but the stormwater work, we agreed would be done without assessing the homeowners at all. Isn't that right? That is correct, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the reminder, Don. Mm -hmm. uh, is anyone else on the council has comment? If not, we do have at least one per person that signed up to speak, uh, Gwen Silver. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mayor, yeah, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the city council, and. Um, Administrators. When do you have something you're showing? Yes, sir. Get some assistance. This is to bring you up to date on the condition of the streets. It's going to go, it's three minutes, so you have to pay attention to what's going on, some of the problems. Mm -hmm. This is what our streets look like throughout the entire development. 
We're not seeing it here yet. I'm sorry. We're, there it is. Okay. This is after the paving. There were streets that were not included in that, that were paved anyway, and they were made worse. There was one half street that wasn't paved that is in our development, and you'll see that on the map. The entire Gatewood community was paved. And of those properties, um, I believe 14 of those properties were not our properties um, at the beginning of this process. They were added and uh, the deeds were processed in, on September 7, 2016. So our request is that we, you correct the paving problem, that the city pave pay for those developments that were, for the properties that were transferred to us unbeknown to the HOA um, last year, and um, that the city pay for those. It's all at the end. I'll leave the presentation if there are questions. There are members of the community that are here tonight, if you'll stand. And all of us object to being um, fined the $10,400. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess at some point in time, Mr. Manager, someone from the staff should comment on these. We're prepared to do that whenever you'd like, Mr. Mayor. Okay. We, we have one other person that, that has signed up to speak, and I'd like to recognize that person. Um, Marilyn Brady, is that correct? If you can come to the podium to the right, please. And is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that hasn't signed up to speak? I'm Mayor afraid. Bell and members of the council, I apologize for my inexperience. Um, no, no, you don't have to apologize. This okay, this is my first time here, so I'm a little no problem. <laughs> um, out of my league here. I moved to um, Stonehill Estates in 2013. Um, I have carefully reviewed my agency disclosure, um, my property disclosure, I should say. There was no indication that I was moving to a development that had undeveloped streets. And on that disclosure, it does not reflect that I was not on city streets. It does not say that it wasn't a private street. And it's been brought to my attention that we received no um, city services, for example, plowing, or street cleaning or whatever. Um, as a nurse care manager through those years, working 40 to 60 hours a week, I was oblivious to what was going on. The one thing I was aware of was the huge holes in front of my driveway, which is a side issue, I understand that, but um, not having received information when I purchased the home that I was eventually going to have to pay for streets is very distressing to me. 
Um, I believe that as council members, and you probably may have not been sitting on the council at the time, I believe Durham council members should have been on the ball informing potential homeowners that they were walking into this mess. Um, that didn't happen. So how can I be responsible for something that happened before I even knew I was going to purchase this property? Um, I couldn't have had that foresight. And when I was buying the property, no one told me. So that's a huge objection for me to have to pay for this. It's my very vague understanding that the Council of Durham, City Council, was supposed to have secured from the developer um, within a contract that they would finish these streets and that there was funds or whatever. Um, I, I'm not sure on the terminology. That's why I started with an apology. Um, and maybe Gwen can address that better than I. But none of that happened. So the, the former council, somewhere along the way, fell down on the job and we're paying for it, or at least part of it. And that doesn't seem fair to me. So I thank you for your time. Do, do you want to speak? Well, you can just come up. Come up to the podium and just state your name and address, please. <coughs> My name is David Thomas, and I live at 409 Quartz Drive in the Stonehill community. What, 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 what is the address? 409 Quartz Drive in the Stonehill community. Okay. And I'm a 20-year resident. I've been in the neighborhood since it was brand new. Um, it was built in three phases. Pulte Homes built the first phase. Um, I think Beezer built the second phase and then KB came in. And it was my understanding that a bond was not secured by the city for a million dollars and KB went bankrupt and then left the, uh, numerous streets in the development undone. And we're having to pay for it and Pulte did our session correctly. And I also don't think that it's fair. And that's really all I have to say about it. All right. I'm Vanessa Brown. I live at 115 Citrine Court in Stonehill Estates. I echo my neighbor's sentiments. And uh, it was shared by another resident who was unable to remain that some of the materials used were experimental when they were paving the streets. Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to ask the manager if you have staff respond to this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sure you all know the, the you know, kind of two different issues. One, the issue associated with the um, assessment, but then the second is maybe the construction standards. So if Ms. Johnson could address the construction standards and inspections mm -hmm. issue, uh, then we can answer any other questions you might have about that first and then move on to the assessment piece. Good evening, Tasha Johnson, Assistant Director of Public Works. So um, what you saw were images of microsurfacing and there were some, a few issues with the workmanship of that work and we are working with the contractor to go in and revisit that to see if we can rectify some of those. The areas that did receive microsurfacing were not assessed to the residents, and microsurfing is not an experimental technique. It is something that we are doing new to Durham as part of the pavement preservation techniques that we will be applying uh, going forward. And what it does is seals the road to some of the cracks and preserves its condition um, to bring it up to a standard that is similar to some of the streets that we did pave. And when you see microservicing directly adjacent to newly paved streets, you do see a stark contract. But after it wears for a little while and cures out, um, you don't notice it as much. But we will be looking at some of the locations that did have some workmanship concerns. What about the durability of the streets? Uh, 
microsurfing does microsurfing doesn't add uh, structure it to does, the street. It does not. It does not. But it does seal some of the cracks and prevents um, retards deterioration over time. So it does improve the longevity of the pavement. And just to clarify, excuse me, that you said the areas that were microsurfaced, they were or were not a part of the assessment. They will not be assessed. Okay. Uh, other questions by members of council and staff on this item. Yes. Recognize Councilman Moffitt and then the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I, I, so I didn't really understand. I don't know who can address this, but um, I understood them to say that uh, homeowners association had lots transferred to them without their knowledge. Do we do we know anything about this? Rob Dwyer, Mayor. Mm -hmm. This is Jonas on this. Robert Joyner, Public Works. Um, so I don't know a, a tremendous amount of details uh, about the transfer of the property. Um, you can just give me a minute to ask a question of... Robert, just tell, say what you know. Yeah. Um, so it's my understanding that some of the things were cl quick claimed deeded to the HOA. They were given away by the previous landowner or landowners or LLCs who owned that property. And they were quick claim deed to the HOA. And those properties are open space, but they are adjacent to um, the roads that were finished and are part of the assessment. I don't know if the city attorney has any comments about quick claim process and how that works, or do we know any, any history about that? I'm not familiar with what happened here. Um, if that was part of the, the overarching plan to transfer those open spaces back to the HOA, I'm just the, not The aware. city wouldn't have been a part of, of yeah. that transaction whatsoever. No. No, that would have been part of by the developer, former developer. So the, the, the way it was stated sounded like the HOA didn't want the property. So if they didn't want the property, they could divest themselves of it. And uh, no? I think can I just, just hand a piece of property over to somebody else without their knowledge and they can't? I mean, I, I would assume that there's some sort of acceptance of, of that. I'm just, again, I don't know the city was a part of that transaction, so I don't know how that went down. Okay, all right. You, you, you can come up to the microphone, please. <clears throat> I was a member of the HOA board at that time, and we received no information regarding the transfer of these uh, parcels. What, what, though, you, it, does the city have to do with that? I'm not clear about that. Well, how can we ex uh, take responsibility for something that we didn't know about? We received no notice. No one told us anything about being gifted properties. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know the details either, but when you do a quick claim, does anyone have to sign anything other than the person's giving the property away? Does someone have to accept it? I, I think you'd have to accept it. I mean, you can't just quick claim for the sake of, of quick claiming it. Nobody said anything to anyone on the board we, um, if Gwen wasn't as thorough as she is, I would not have found out about this. No one would have found out. Well, that, and that, this, this happened in 2016, from my understanding, and she only found out recently. I, I'm not, I'm not gonna try to argue that mm -hmm. one at all, because I know absolutely nothing other than what you told me, but I, I don't see how that's an issue for the city. It seems to me that's an issue between the homeowners association and whoever owned the land. And I, I can't, I don't know who was on the homeowner association, who would have been the person responsible for signing it, but you might want to go back and check and see when, when, the, when it was done, who signed for it. But I, I don't see where the city has any responsibility at all for that. Well, I would hope that our representatives would assist us in finding out this information. Certainly Robert Joyner has been very, very helpful in pushing through whatever we needed in order to get the streets paid. Well, let, and let, let, uh, let, and let me, we let me, received let me, no information. Let, let, me, let me suggest this, if you don't mind. Certainly. Uh, and I don't want the city taking on any more responsibility than it has, but it seems to me that if it was recorded, it should be in the Register of Deeds office. Somebody ought to be able to show 
re recordation and show who signed what. And Mr. Turner, could you just look at that? Sure. All right. So. Thank you. Uh, sure. Are, are there other comments or questions on this item? There's a question I recognize. Um, Who's that? Don already dealt with it. Do you have any more on that, Don? Okay. Mayor Ma Bell, if the assessment includes the paving of those streets, it is of everybody's concern. And I believe it was stated that the paving of those streets was included. Okay, is it, we, we, it's a long history on this. And I guess I've been involved since we started listening to this, and I know, as Don has indicated, we made quite a bit of compromise on the city's part in terms of trying to reduce the amount of dollars that the property owners would have to pay. And I know it's not going to be satisfactory to everyone, but uh, I think we've done legal when, within what I think is reasonable, given what the situation was. But I, I recognize the young lady who had the hand up if you want to come up to speak. Hello, my name is Stacy Reeves, and I live in Stonehill. I've been a resident for 19 years, my Your first home. Address. Your address? 511 Quartz Drive. Um, and I actually spoke to the workers, and they are the ones that told me that it was an experimental process that they weren't using, and it wasn't what they, we used in other communities. And for a couple of days, my neighbors and I rode around in every single street in our neighborhood and all of them look like those pictures she showed you. Now, if we do need to pay for it, I understand. I have no problem for paying for quality work. And I don't think the city would want to be known to be making people pay for unquality work. So if you make it right, then I see no problem, you know, on my end. Um, but I mean, the, my streets look better last year than they do now and for the last 19 years. So. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I, I think we've heard your comments and your concerns. The pictures show it. We've heard the staff response in terms of what they're going to do. And I, I don't want to get into whether it's experimental or not. But mm -hmm. And none of that work is being charged back to yeah, that's, us. That's the other point. You aren't being charged for it. OK, we'll see. <laughs> and, any other questions, comments? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing. And matters back before the council on this item. Mayor, I'll, I'll move that we had uh, confirmed the assessment roll for street completion in Stonehill. Is there a second to that? I'll second. It's been proper moving second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. I'm sorry. Just, just uh, for discussion, I, I, I think this is a tough decision. Uh, however, we have gone around and we've reduced the amount of obligation uh, on the residents over the course of time. and. Uh, we made arrangements for people to be able to um, uh, deal with extenuating circ circumstances. So I think we, it may not be satisfactory. I know that the most satisfactory thing would be for the city to pay for all of it. Uh, but I think we've come a long way uh, over the course of the last uh, few years. So um, that's why I offered a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Mayor Bell had already opened the vote. Can you? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. You did close it. <laughs> it passes seven to zero. Okay, thank you. And uh, City Attorney, if, if someone will give the City Attorney a contact, uh, he'll let you know what he finds out about the quick claim deed. Uh, one item was pool item 29, which was the city logo, and this is Craig Carter. It's Craig Carter, still present. Come forward, please. Hello, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council. Thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to come today. Um, I am the social media specialist for the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau, but today I'm here as a private citizen. I have uh, a proposed alternative to the city logo. Um, also have a, another physical copy if you'd like to see it up close.
so uh, this design, which we are trying to project on the screens, um, I wanted to uh, create a, a concept that uh, it, by using the negative space, um, it, cr it creates a clean, modern look to represent a modern city. Um, and I was, was thinking about this, I think a, a Durham isn't a logo so much as is a place. And when designing it, I found that the, the flag itself was one of the most iconic symbols of um, the, the city. And uh, the flag is such a beautiful and iconic symbol, I wanted to create a logo that was contained entirely within the flag. Um, this, uh, this typeface is uh, called Railway. It's a, a very elegant sans serif typeface. It's very strong and clean and legible. And uh, it's from Google Fonts, making it very friendly for use in print and digital. And uh, it's also open source and free to use. And uh, that's, that's all. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, I like <laughs> Thank you. Just to say the city of, and the, uh, you don't know that that's the city of Durham, and no, this, this was about the city of Durham. I, I thought this was about the flag, Durham, North Carolina. And I thought what you've done is you inserted the city in there versus being any flag. I thought that's what's different. You, you insert the word Durham. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess maybe, maybe I understand that the logos that we see, is city of Durham a part of the flag? City of Durham is not part of the flag. It is part of our logo, however. Which, which prominently features our city flag in addition to the word city. And I think the concern the city... DCBB, I'm sorry, if DCBB wanted to use that for representing the Durham community, that's perfectly fine. This was a recommendation about the city of Durham government's logo, not the community's logo or flag. Well, this lapel pin I got on now, <laughs> What's going to happen to that? Is it still usable? Tell me, I'm serious. What, 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 let me I'll take it off and look at it again. Uh, it's it's nice got Durham. It has Durham on the on the. People look at it. And they, oh, you're from Durham. They look at the flag. So is Durham going off the flag or, or what? I'm, 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 is Durham coming off of the yeah, flag? Yeah, it's the name Durham coming off of here. No, it's not. It's still going to be a part of the the logo, city of Durham. So, Mr. Mayor, I believe the, the issue here is um, the, the, the flag of the city of Durham is not the same thing as our logo. Right. The, the flag forms the largest element in our logo. Right. But currently, uh, the logo also contains the word Durham across the top, vertically, and on the bottom, uh, the year 1869, and then below that, the word city of medicine. The proposal before us today would remove the elements above and below the flag and insert in their place uh, a, a different font of text that simply says City of Durham. Um, and uh, I, I understand this confusion because I shared it uh, when I was interviewed by the, the folks who helped us put the uh, design refresh for our logo together. Uh, it was not 100% clear to me what was meant by the logo versus the city flag, and I was very helpfully instructed by um, the, the folks who were helping us with this effort. Um, I believe that the work that this gentleman has done, again, on his own time, and I really appreciate that, um, is an alternative logo presentation that, again, does not seek to replace the city flag, mm -hmm. but merely is an alternative proposal for our refreshed city logo. And if I heard the city manager uh, correctly, I believe one of the concerns that he expressed is that the proposed alternative being put forward by this Durham resident does not include uh, the word city. Exactly. Um, and city of course, of there Durham. is a county uh, of Durham as well mm -hmm. um, that does not use our city flag uh, in, its, uh, in its logo or any other materials. Um, and I believe the concern um, is that simply using the word Durham um, could tend to insert confusion into, uh, into what we're trying to do. And I believe that the logos that are, were previously on the screen in front of us um, uh, dispel that potential confusion as well as eliminating some of the, I, I will call them antiquated um, 
elements in our logo, specifically 1869, the, the year of our founding, although in two years that will become much more uh, interesting, um, but we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. Um, and the city of medicine portion element of the logo, uh, I expressed my personal uh, feeling that it was not important that that be in the logo, and I think some other folks uh, indicated, if, as I read the presentation, um, that it was in some way limiting uh, how people thought of the city, and that's why that was removed. Um, I'm a, I don't think that the logo uh, refresh that has been proposed by staff is a revolutionary design change in our logo, but it does represent um, a step away from uh, some of the more antiquated elements and I step into a more diverse and usable logo because it now has a vertical use case and a horizontal use case and as the presentation goes on to show us the different city departments can use that horizontal logo in a number of different ways that I think uh, are graphically appealing set set out the city's identity in a in a pretty identifiable way um, and so I'm I'm uh, actually a big fan of the the new logo design uh, I do appreciate the work that you did on the on the alternative. I saw it on social media um, uh, over the weekend. I thought it was an interesting idea to use the negative space. I thought the font was perfectly acceptable. Um, but my preference would be to um, move forward on the staff's recommendation. And I hope that all that has been helpful to anyone who wanted to hear it. Well, Charles, that's, that, was, that was helpful. And I guess I got so lost in focusing on the flag and what was attached to it, then talking about the logo. I, I, I guess I didn't really look, look at these things as being logo. You had a flag and that hasn't changed except you got it vertically and horizontally. That's, that's the only difference I see. Mm -hmm. What you put on top of it, put it beside of it, that's, that's the definition. I, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm, I'm with you now. I, I was more focused on, I guess, my pen, what he saw. City of Durham, the name and all that stuff, but we're really just talking about. Well, come around and take your. Mayor, nobody's taking my lapel pen away. I'm, I'm keeping I'm, it. I'm, 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 I'm comfortable. It's all me. What What I liked about what you had, you had Durham in, in the. I would say City of Durham, but rather just Durham. But I, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Where did you have this Mayor? conversation, John? <laughs> um, I was the the staff, the consultant oh, you, oh, okay. That's who the reached who, yeah, the who worked on the on the logo design. Okay. Uh, reached out to me for a quite a lengthy interview. Um, which I shared many thoughts about the design okay. elements and whatnot. Thank you. All of your brilliance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hold, hold on for just a minute. The Mayor Pro Tem has invited us on the council, Council Moffitt, and then I'll get to. Would you reach out to our youth for their opinion? I'm sorry, for reach out to youth, Y O U T H, young people. We reached out to um, various audiences, including. Um, uh, the um, Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau, of course, we got their feedback, and the Chamber of Commerce, um, Blackwell Management, however, and a lot of internal staff. However, we did not include the youth in this. I was actually, I should have said Youth Commission, uh, because they need to be more involved in, in decision making. We'll definitely do that the next time. All right, Councilman Mark. Just an observation, this page is actually very informative because it's got the old logo on it as well. Sometimes we overlook it because um, it's, it's usually there. But th and this is also instructive because this is sort of one way that the logo would be used. So you can look at the logo that's on the, on the page and look down to the corner and think about, you know, how this would be on the, on the scene. I, I'm a... I, I, believe it's quite a bit of work. I appreciate the work that you've done. I also believe that quite a bit of work went into the logos that are in front of us. And if we're dissatisfied with them, then we should send them back to staff for further work. But I can't see adopting something different tonight if just on spur of the moment. We got quite a lot of positive feedback on the logo. Uh, on the flag itself. In fact, the flag was the most positive element of it. And um, part of what we, our challenge was, was a way to use the font along with the colors and the logo itself. And uh, we think we achieved that with the, the current logo that we're proposing. Mr. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. 
my concern has to do with our lack of involvement of our youth commission. And they are supposed to be an advisory committee um, for decisions. And I hope they can become a part of what we're doing, uh, especially with things of this nature. And I know it's too late for that now, but we need to, um, I've heard so much talk about young people. Uh, so I think we need to make sure that the young people are involved in decision making. Yes, ma'am. Recognize uh, Councilman Shule. So, Beverly, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Suppose someone wanted to use the logo or the, suppose someone wanted to use the flag mm -hmm. uh, in such a manner as Craig has used it with the Durham in there inside it. What, what is our stance on that? We don't have a policy per se against that. In fact, um, a few years ago, we did talk about copywriting the flag and we never did because of um, some challenges, some cost uh, issues. We certainly can do that. However, there are a lot of companies now that are using the flag and um, representing their own companies or selling a product using the flag. And we have not asked them not to unless we've seen it used in some egregious manner. So this, this could be available for use for example, if the Durham Convention of Business Bureau wanted to use it in this way or some other. Sure. Is that right? It could be, yes. You don't encourage it. We don't encourage it. We have a so, um, well, excuse me, I'm, but at the same time, the Durham Visitors Convention of Business Bureau represents much broader area than the city of Durham. Right. And so we wouldn't want to restrict their use to only the city of Durham if they had a broader, a broader market. Um, you know, could say Durham NC. It could you know people could use a lot of different, but it, but they're not representing the city government of the city of Durham, yeah. and that's the intent of this logo. Okay, thank you. Well, see, my my dumbness, what I miss, I was more focused on the flag than anything else. I mean, I, I never, I, I I'll be honest, I really never thought about this being a logo, Durham the flag, 1869, the city of Madison. I never thought about it as being a logo. I was in exactly the same place, Mr. Okay. Mayor. The, they explained it to me okay. several times before I got exactly. Okay. I had the same problem. Okay. Mr. Mayor, um, I should have asked when, when we had the work session. Nobody wanted to listen. But <laughs> yeah, nobody right. wanted to hear it. Exactly. That's right. Don't talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Mayor, one you were ready to go. One yeah. more. So, uh, just real quickly. So, I have a lot, uh, personal experience with using the flag recently, um, and uh, I see at least one other person in this room who does as well. Um, and so, I mean, I just, I do think that's something we need to give some thought to. And again, maybe, you know, is w how are we trying to protect this? That's a different question than what we're talking about here, but it just is a thought. Okay. Um, and um, we do pursue that. But I do, I think that what we've got is good. I like it a lot. I think this is really interesting. Um, but I think the staff's done a lot of good work. It, it just, you know, it, it strikes me as this is the kind of thing when we're really trying to do, you know, at, at some point we're going to be doing something you know, we're going to want a new logo at some point, and we can have an open process, and it would probably be a lot less expensive than the $200,000 that Raleigh just spent for their tree. Um, I was pleased that our logo is a heck of a lot better than theirs. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, anyway, so I think it's a good idea, but I like, I like what we've done. I think we've had a good process and ready to go in. Okay. I guess we need to vote on this, right? Mayor, I'll, Mr. Mayor, I'll move to approve the updated Steve Durham logo as uh, outlined in our agenda. Second. And properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank thanks, you. Governor. Thank you. It passes everybody. seven to zero. Right. Anything else to come before the council before we adjourn at 921 p.m.? We have work session tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Thank you. The meeting's adjourned. Your world. <laughs>